You're, you, I can hear you perfectly. Mm -hmm. I didn't know your voice carried so well. That's awesome. It does. I'm a journalist. That's what I went to school for. You what are a school. journalist. Come through. Went to yes. J school. Portia Williams. Come on. Wait, Portia Williams went to journalism school too? No. You remember um, season nine reunion with the whole Candy Phaedra thing? Portia was like, I am a journalist. I was sent a cease and desist. <laughs> yeah. Like, if Portia's a journalist, I'm an this astronaut. This is when she was on Dish Nation. Yes. So she was in it. Like, well, speaking of which, shout out to Dish Nation because I just hired Claudia. Jessie Wu and uh, Tamar. Cla oh, Tamar. Right. I almost, I almost said Claudia. <laughs> Claudia Jordan has so many jobs. Um, Tamar Braxton. I just saw Claudia um, filming with the season 15, the finale girls at Atlanta. Yes, but Tamar and Jesse are the ones who got signed to Dish Nation, which is awesome. Yes. Jesse's our good Haitian sis. At some point, I'm going to have to have her on the show. She's so funny, though, but she's also a cancer. Does she still do her videos? Sister. Sister. Yeah, she does. She My does thing like is, her. I'm Haitian, so I know all the words she's saying. I'm surprised by how many people who are not Haitian still laugh at her jokes not knowing the words, which makes you realize how funny you are in a way that it's almost like, Communication is 93% nonverbal. So if you say something in a funny way, even if somebody doesn't speak Creole, they know it's funny. Y'all don't get confused listening to Jesse talk? I mean, I don't, but you, you've seen my friends. They are Oh, Caribbean, that's true. You, African, you lived in they, Miami. And like, you real friends, ethnic for, for a boy from my Chicago. My friendship circle is the United Nations. It really, your house I, is like the UN. Mm -hmm. Actually, this is the perfect segue. For those of you who are listening and not watching, um, we have an old fave back. We have our first... Uh, actually, what did we call you guys? Play cousins. So we're doing this thing called play cousins. People who come all the time. Okay. You were our first play cousin. Oh, was that the pandemic when we did it virtual? Yeah, because you came on one, two. Is this like your fourth time? Uh, third or fourth. Yes. Oh my God, Jeffrey. If we're including the, the virtual one, yeah. This is Jeffrey's fourth time. So Jeffrey is officially, as of today, the guest that we've had the most on Humanized ever. Hey. Yay! Hey. Clap for Jeffrey. Hey. Hey. Uh, Chef Jeffrey, uh, you made history. So this is the perfect segue because somebody else made history recently. So you are the most visited guest oh. on Humanized. And Beyonce won uh, a Grammy last night. Yes, four. She won four Grammys. Um, but did she really? That's the question. Let's get right into it, guys. Uh, for full disclosure, uh, welcome to Humanized. I'm your host, Blue Toulousma. And today we're having a special rea reality show roundup because we talk about deep things. We talk about emotions. We talk about all this stuff. But I wanted to have a fun episode where we just kikied about all the ratchet shit that we watch on television. And full disclosure, I don't know when you're going to see this. Actually, you're probably going to see it this week. We're having Grammy talk because the Grammys were last night. Yes. Um, I am sick as a dog. I have been knocked out on meds for 90% of the day, but I literally- wait, 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 wait. Before you start, can we like toast? No, no, I'm about to, I'm, I'm oh, queuing okay. you up. I was like, wait. But the, the, the one reason I left my house this weekend, I left my house for a couple of hours to lay on Jeffrey's couch and have him feed me and <laughs> give me libations. And one of the things that Jeffrey made last night that got me super excited, this is so what a good friend he is, Jeffrey bought homemade- espresso martinis to the studio. Jeffrey, I was going to have us chugging on moonshine, but you have elevated it. So we're going to toast before we start. You know, we always toast. And this time I'm going to let you do the toast, Jeffrey. Uh, well, this is to uh, 2023. Uh-huh. A great year, great episodes. I'm sure it's a lot of things coming up on Human Eyes that we cannot wait to see. Plug, uh-huh. And to just the fun we're about to have for the next hour. Oh, hell yeah. All and right. to us not getting yeah. and sued. And us not wasting these martinis. Oh, waste. <laughs> I could drink this at one gulp, but I don't want to scare myself on mm. camera. Oh, that is. I feel like I just heard every gulp both of us took in my headphones, so I didn't it's know like they ASM had it. <laughs> what is it, ASMR? Right. We're gulping. Every episode we gulp, and then by the end we sip. By the end we sip, yeah. Yeah, I don't know if we can make that commercial without getting stricken by. And um, if you do finish, I got enough to refill your glass. If I finish friend <laughs> that was delicious for those of you who have envy that was delicious um all right i'm gonna go right into the to the grammys because for those of you who did not watch the grammy were last night they were in los angeles yes, yes staple center i began confused because they keep is it called crypto for real now yeah. and so we watched it at your house i'm laid on the couch sick but full of good food you had a couple of people over, and at one point, you made a prediction that we all wished wouldn't come true. Now, for those of you who don't know, they were making a big deal the entire time. Beyonce is currently tied with uh, Quincy Jones, and if she wins just, you know, four more Grammys, then she will be the most winningest ass bitch ever in the Grammy history. Mm -hmm. 
they kept on pushing that narrative. So when she won the first three, and then the electronic music category came off. What was it? Electro- uh, Ele- dance. Best dance. Best dance, yeah. electronic, whatever, whatever. Mind you, this category, this dance category, Beyonce is the first black woman to ever even be in the category. So the minute they put her in the category, I was like, they're probably going to give it to her because she's the first black woman, right? Mm-hmm. I, just, I, just, I just heard some um, fire trucks fire going by. Here. Why, uh, <laughs> yeah, why is it so loud when we have on headphones? That's interesting. All right, so they made this big deal about it. The category comes up, Beyonce wins, and you look at all of us and you say, what did you predict when you saw her win the, the, that no, category? It was when she won record of the year that I said. Yes. yes. And what did you say? Uh, um, I said they're not going to give her album of the year. And because. the room was angry. We were like, Jeffrey, uh, shut the hell up. We rebuke you in the name of all that is good. And because why did you make the prediction? What they were not going to do, they were not going to bring her there and not let her leave a winner because she broke the record. They wanted they her to break, had, break the record. It's very much like, okay, well, you can't be mad and say we didn't give her anything. She has officially broken the record. She is the most decorated Grammy winner of all artists of all time. But bullshit. <laughs> what y'all thought? Because that ain't the thing. I mean, of course, that's a title for. But what Beyonce wanted, album of the year. She could have literally just only won album of the year and put her still tied. What Beyonce deserved was what deserved, album yeah, of the year. Was album of the year. Now, uh, recently, actually, just last week, we had Bridget Kelly on. Mm-hmm. Bridget Kelly was signed to Rock Nation. Bridget Kelly was on Private Jets with Beyonce and, J- AJ- and Jay Z. Sorry, the the um. Martinez are already kicking in. These are delicious, Jeffrey. Thank you. Um, Bridget is a singer, right? So she's a singer singer. She's not in it for the look. She loves the art of music. While I was sitting at her at your house, she sent me a long text about this is bullshit. And I sat and thought about it from a singer's perspective. She was like, Blue, singers don't sing to break random records. Mm-hmm. We sing to be decorated, I mean to be recognized for our actual work. She put her foot in that album and they played in her face. I mean, they, I can say they play, they dangled. No, they played in her face. She won. Category, she was the first black woman in the dance category. Token. She has the most uh, Grammys now. Like token. So she did win for the body of work. Now she may not have gotten the the big one. You know, like oh, best picture at the uh, Oscars. She didn't get the big one. The one that she deserved and that she worked hard for. I'm sorry if I tell you that I want to bake a cake and all I need for you is to go to the supermarket and bring me some eggs. I don't care how much champagne you bring instead. I needed eggs for what I was trying to do. Beyonce wanted to win the award that spoke to the work that she did. And I feel like she got a consolation prize. I feel like they played in her face. Yeah. Um, I mean, I do wonder now um, who was on the Grammy, the voting panel, because now it's, you know, obviously with in the last few years, diversity being the big talk of things. I'm sure it wasn't just a table full of, you know, old, probably white men. No, not anymore. So I'm curious who was on the voting panel. Committee. And then it also it just kind of gave me Susan Lucci. It's very Susan Lucci. Times. I want to know who Beyonce pissed off in the Recording Academy, why they keep playing with her like this. Speaking of diversity, what did you feel about that paint by numbers diversity approach towards the oh, round the table? Thing. The fan they so for those of you who didn't watch the Grammys last night, there was like think like 2,700 albums up for <laughs> album of the year. And for every song, I mean, or every artist, they picked the most obvious archetype mm-hmm. to be their token for visibility and diversity. Yeah. So they had, uh, you know, a plus size, sassy black woman advocating for Beyonce. Then they had a sweet grandma advocating for Harry Styles because, you know, he's just the kind of boy that you want your kids to bring home. Then they had a Latina for like Bad Bunny or somebody. It was so on the nose. Yeah, and then I think they they tried to shake it up by having somebody who was differently able in a wheelchair yeah, for Kendrick Lamar. Uh, yeah, Kendrick. But it was very paint by numbers. We are the world united because of Benetton. Oh, yeah. and my question was the effort. Okay, we uh, we appreciate diversity, but was it a little bit uh, corny the way that they executed it? Well, here's the thing. I have to say, um, last night was the first time in a long time I actually enjoyed the Grammys as a whole. The show. Was actually it's because we were at your house home. having fun with you. Yeah, but like, even you know, I was watching. It was times where y'all were talking. I would just be watching it. I was actually <laughs> thoroughly entertained by the you show. Were. But that was the first thing I noticed when they went to that fan panel table situation. Mm-hmm. I was like, oh, they heard y'all when y'all said diversity, and they said y'all ain't gonna say we missed ageism, <laughs> colorism. They shoved it down um, our throats. Hey, I don't, I don't know the proper term. Please don't cancel me. But 
for a handicap, you know, those differently able, disabled. Differently able, they made sure they had everybody. Y'all got handicapped in there. people, you have fat people, you have white people, you had old people. I, I I promise you somebody up there was probably dyslexic. I, I think they they, they literally had somebody pregnant. Oh, somebody was like, probably they pregnant. They said we're not too. missing anything. They really were not. They were missing a little person. Oh. They didn't have a little person. Jeffrey, Ooh. I'm very See? scared to talk about that community because I don't no. know. I no, want I them to know. be recognized. Now I, y'all I need want, to no, the I want them to be recognized, but I do not feel like I'm educated enough to talk about little people without saying the wrong thing. I just thing. know I did not see one. We, That's what I'm saying. Well, technically, the lady in the wheelchair might have been a little person. Okay, so she was too poor. Look. We, let's change topics so before. We, we're no we're trying not to get canceled, <laughs> but, but this goes to show you the diversity approach was so crude and mm-hmm. on the nose, right? And I would say, okay, you know what? Th- to the rich white men who were so scared that they greenlit that to happen, I understand. Applause. I under- applause for the effort. We get what you were trying to exactly. do. But what true inclusion looks like isn't having a token black woman in a wheelchair talking about how much she loves Kendrick Lamar. True inclusion is having categories that reflect everybody who's actually good rather than who you think makes sense for color. Perfect example. The Grammys, if you are black, you could yodel to your faces off. They're going to be hard pressed to not call you urban R&B and rap. Like everything we do is R&B and rap just because we black. We can, we can be doing anything. So I think there's some categories that we don't get just because we're black. And then, and then we get all shoved into the urban quote unquote Urban means black, y'all. The urban categories, even when it doesn't make sense. Perfect example, Chris Brown and Robert, Gla- uh, Robert Glasper. I actually went to Robert Glasper's pre-Grammy jam session on Friday where he said, hey, y'all, I'm up for two Grammys, R&B album of the year and something else. Chris Brown was like, who the F is Robert Glasper, which was a really poor thing to say. Robert Glasper received an apology from Chris Brown today. So thank you, Chris, for being Jeffrey's birthday twin and not embarrass him for once because your birthday twin... <laughs> You and Chris Brown, I can imagine what it's like having the same birthday as him. So Chris was like, I'm sorry, Robert. But then he said, I will say this, though. You and I should have never been in the same category. And I agree with him on that. The uh, the category that Chris was in, I think he should have won. I think there's a category, category. I think it was like best R&B album. And what I, did the R&B at the show? It was, it was R&B something. And Chris, oh, okay. Chris was saying the R&B category that we were in, I feel like Robert Glasper's work is amazing now that I've Googled it mm-hmm. and you've cussed me out and told me that he's amazing. I agree he's amazing, but our music should not be in the same category. Mm-hmm. What do you think about the way that they place people? Because you know Nicki Minaj was about to burn the Grammys down because of... Well, Nicki didn't... I'm sorry, Barbs. Nicki didn't have a song that was... Again, I said Ooh. I don't I don't know the dates for when the Grammy music come out. The only song in the last recent years I feel like should have been nominated for Nicki is Do We Have a Problem? I thought that uh, one should have been, but if they're talking about Freaky Girl, no, it's fun. She meant Freaky but it Girl. Wasn't, Freaky Girl was Freaky not. Freaky Girl is like leftovers. Yeah, and I'm not at all like I like Nikki, so it's not at all like a, oh I hate Nikki. No, I like Nikki, but in thinking of those accolades, like, Freaky Girl, no. Do we have a problem? Yes, they could have thrown it in there. Well, speaking of Freaky Girl, because I've been working on my uh, segues, how do we feel about Smokey Robinson, who was on the show, who uh, kind of made his own little viral moment pre- before the show because of his new album, Gasms, that is coming out. Uh, Jeffrey, we talked about this last night. For those of you who don't know, the 82-year-old is coming out with a new album in the next couple of weeks. And he has songs on it called How Do You Make It Feel, I Want to Know Your Body, and the song that we all are the most curious about called I Fit In There. Because guess what? (laughs) Guess what? Now you're going to listen to it. Smokey Robinson has a song on an album called Gasms, and the song is called I Fit In There. Now, how do you feel about an 82-year-old man thirst trapping with his peen for record sales? Again, like, listen. Smokey is Unky Smokey's know, creepy or is this, is this like completely brilliant? It's not creepy. I think it's brilliant. Smokey, no. How do I get y'all to listen to my music? He's probably going to have a TikTok something, even though people be talking about fun his of dick. Him, it sells. That's like when, uh, do you remember years ago when Brian McKnight uh, came Let out? Let me know how that pussy yes. work. Yes, I remember yes, that. Like, I thought that was a spoof for several years before I realized it was the real song. I don't know. He was, he was ahead of his time. Had that been Jeffrey, after the TikTok period, I think it would have been different. Jeffrey, if you were 82 years old, Trying to commodify your penis but also, for sales. We don't, we don't know what the lyrics of the song. The, I fit the in title, there. The title could be for attention, but we don't know what the lyrics are. But equally blue, are you listening? There's to There's 70 Robinson? years of Smokey Robinson's catalog. We all know exactly what the hell Uncle Smokey. Are you gonna listen to this album? I'm gonna listen to I fit in there because I need to hear what it sounds like. Let me know because I'm not even gonna listen to it for you, the you, shock. You're not no. gonna listen to the shock value. No. I want to know. I'll see it when they're doing the uh, videos <laughs> on TikTok and everything. I, he his hips still work though. There's a, a thing. Oh yeah, it. Smokey's on that stage with Stevie. They was getting it last night. Okay, y'all know. Okay, you guys. I have a very unpopular Stevie Wonder story, and I'm drunk enough from this th- this martini. I'm gonna share it. What did I say last night? I said Stevie Wonder 
you need to train as if you're going to a marathon to go to a Stevie Wonder concert. I went to a Stevie Wonder concert in Washington, D.C., and whatever that big stadium is near the movie theater where they have the um, the games. And we were there for six hours. They had to shut down the stadium because every time the audience thought the concert was over, we got up to leave. And you know when you're blind, your other senses are, are invigorated. Stevie could feel us leaving and he would start playing us a hit. I would get up to leave. I just called to say, I love you. I'm like, okay, Stevie, it's been four hours. There's a ribbon in the sky. Like every time we tried to leave, he would just say a song that he knew that we would love and bring us back. I felt like I was being held hostage by Stevie Wonder. Yeah, it was, I mean, and I last could night, not do that. He, he, did, he did one song and I think it lasted like 20 minutes. I don't know, but I have to, like, I can imagine the energy through the TV when they were playing felt so good. He so is a god. Obviously, they weren't there for six hours, but I'm sure for that, <laughs> he might have went two minutes past his time. He would have went the whole show like, if y'all let him. You know, DJ Callum had eight minutes. Stevie had eight minutes, but he went ten. <laughs> he did but ten. that energy, like them playing the music, I was like, oh, this, it looks like it felt People, good to be there. Let me tell you, Stevie Wonder's music feels like religion. Like, you feel it. Like, like, you know when you go to those black churches in the, in the deep south and people, you can feel the Holy mm -hmm. Ghost? The first four hours, I was happy. Around f hour five, you're like, this man is old enough to be my grandfather. How is he? <laughs> More energy than me. <laughs> Yo, I, but you know what they said about Stevie and Ray Charles? Like, people should not sleep on them just because they were, they were blind. They were getting bitches. Yeah. Are we allowed to say that? Stevie Wonder would be getting girls. Didn't he just, I don't know, I'm not going to. He got like a hundred kids, I think. Yeah, I <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we have probably slandered our elders. Stevie Wonder, we love you, and I hope to meet you someday. Smokey Robinson, um, your hips don't lie. Uh, speaking of our elders, there was a hip hop 50th anniversary. I love yes. it last night. Like, I absolutely thought it was amazing. I love how, you know, it started from the beginning, took it to the future. And I'm not gonna say she's my favorite artist, but honestly, I was very happy to see Glorilla up there. I'm F R E E. Like, no, uh, this yeah. girl, I don't know what her career is gonna do, but she will always be able to look back and be like, yo, I was on that Grammy stage. I wanna hear if her voice still sounds like that because she sounds like <laughs> Deb Antony. Like, she, that, that voice is older than she is. Did you see her on the shade room this morning? No. She posted a video saying that she is not gonna wear a wash that wig ever again. A what? She, she met Beyonce while wearing a wig. So she's like, this is my Beyonce wig. I'm going to frame it and never wear it again because this is the wig that I met Beyonce at in the Grammys. That's dope. I like to just see artists having fun. Like yes. Having a good time. And that's what I feel like she had. I don't know. Oh, no. Gl Gl like Glorilla, had Glorilla had a great time. Yeah. But it was a great performance. I do think there was. We wish Lotto had had that spot, though. We, did, I, we were saying yeah. that in the room. I was, I, well, I said, had this been last year, I think Lotto would have had the spot because Big Energy was a big hit for her. And, and Mariah, Mariah Carey, yeah. So I do think Lotto would have been there, but I'm, I'm still happy for Glorilla. I do wish that maybe they would have inserted, we talked about why they couldn't do Lil' Kim, but yeah. maybe had inserted either Foxy Brown or Eve See, we had a, we had a conversation like about that. That's territory. It's, it is, but we talked about how, unfortunately, the, the rap girls are pitted against each other. So if you had Kim, then all of the Nicki, the Barbs people would have been mad. If you had Foxy, they would have like, then Lil' Kim's fans would have been mad. But you know what? I do wonder, I think all of those artists were Grammy-nominated artists. And I really? don't think, I know Kim, her Grammy is with Lady Marmalade. Right. Foxy doesn't have a Grammy. And Ooh. so I'm wondering maybe, and I don't think Eve has a Grammy. Poor Inga. Y'all really, like, I feel like Foxy Brown does not get her flowers. Well, also, no. I Enough. mean, that was before they were respecting, you know, rap in the I Grammys. know, but I feel like we've we've fought to save, it's almost like Seven Private Ryan, we fought to save some of the legends. So, so, Missy Elliott. There mm -hmm. was a whole campaign on Twitter to bring Missy's, like, sound back to the forefront. Yeah. We fought to save um, Lil' Kim. Jason Lee's friends with Lil' Kim. He's constantly shouting her out and making sure that whatever platform he's on, Lil' Kim's getting shouted out. He does the same thing with Queen Latifah. Mm -hmm. I feel like of all the queens from the back that we keep on pushing forward, I think Foxy got left behind. Well, because when Foxy had, when she lost her hearing, she never really, her flow never came back from that. That's true. I don't know if she present day, like her hearings, you know, but her flow never came back because she put out a couple mixtapes. She was even on Nicki's uh, Queen album. And it's really? not like Nikki to help her out. She was just like, y'all bang the drums. Just like, give us oh, some beats. Oh, not Foxy was playing the triangle. It just, it, no, it just sounded oh. like her voice, it just sounded like she couldn't keep up. So I think that from all of that, it might have affected her flow. But so what does that mean, though, right? Because when you are a legend, but you lose the thing that made you a legend, how do we still honor you? Just because I mean, Foxy can't float no more doesn't mean I wouldn't be excited and cry seeing her on stage being awarded in some kind of way. I mean, yeah. 
um, how it feels so transactional. That's, like, cause you can't flow, you can't come. You keep the music. Well, I mean, that sucks. You keep the music <laughs> alive, though. I mean, I really, really wish that Lotto was there. Um, Lotto's been in a lot of pain. Lotto was there. I mean, Lotto was there on the stage performing. But Glorilla, there's something about her that makes me really, really root for her. Um, was there anybody that you saw from the old heads that you were shocked or excited to see? Flavor Flav. Um, showing up, God help him, after he admitted that he had been taking $2,500 worth of drugs oh for the past six years. The fact that he has nose cavities is, is, an, is a miracle. It was good seeing him. It was good for me seeing two-thirds of salt and pepper. Yes. It, I mean, Talk now, about so this it. is kind of what you just asked about, you know, keeping the legends alive. I get it. Y'all got beef right now, but that 50th hip-hop celebration, I think Spinderella should have been there. Spinderella should have been there. She was a part there. of it. Even though y'all have beef, she, you know, not officially in the group. That's still a moment she made history for. So. We on Hollywood Unlocked, we uh, did a, two recordings with, with uh, Spinderella, and mm. she is amazing. And when you hear her side of the story, Salt and Pepper are legends, but I wanted to fight them by the time she was the, done telling pause. her story. Do you remember which song they performed that snippet of what? On, when they were on stage? Do you remember which song? No, was? I was just so excited to see them. They look like a lesbian couple to me. Now that I think <laughs> about it, remember there was an original DJ before Spinderella, so I'm wondering, oh, wait, what song were they oh, doing? Oh, you think they were petty and did a song that was before That's why, her? Yeah, I just, it just clicked. I'm like, wait, what song did they do? Was Spinderella on the track? <laughs> do you know who I think of whenever I hear Spinderella now? Who? Wendy Williams. Why? Because Wendy Williams was supposed to be the original Spinderella. Oh, I do remember that in the bio, yeah. And I miss Wendy so much. No yeah. disrespect to Sherry Shepard. Yeah. Let's talk about it. Because because me and Jeffrey, that, oh, I'm sorry. me and Jeffrey are real fans of television. Like, we don't just do this because it's our jobs. Like, we met on set on a show where we were going to get to Kiki like this about, about TV all the time. Yeah. I will say that Sherry Shepard's heart won me over because you can tell that she's a praying woman, that she's a good person. She's probably a great friend. And I can see why for an audience of white and mixed and elderly people and kids you know the, the demographic mm -hmm. of daytime tv shows in the space that wendy already carved i could see why sherry would be a stabilizing force but even on her best day sherry is not wendy well i'm a okay and i'm wrap this up in a pretty little bow so sherry shepherd holds a special place in my heart yeah like sherry shepherd was like one of the final things that pushed me to move to la when she got the view and you know they do that little intro who you are blah 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 mm -hmm. one of the things she said uh, just about moving to hollywood in period she had a son and all this and that was um a quote His name is jeffrey just like you yeah, his mm -hmm. name's Jeffrey. Mm -hmm. um, she said, if it were all about faith, you wouldn't need stability. Mm -hmm. No, I'm sorry, if it were all about stability, you wouldn't need faith. I'm sorry, it's the espresso martini and other things. These martinis um, are so good. Oh my God. If it were all about stability, you wouldn't need faith. Mm -hmm. And that was just like, you know, just jump, just try it. So that's why I moved to LA. But the thing is, I love Sherry for me. I think there's a world where even if Wendy were present on TV, Sherry could also have her show. Absolutely. Because they're two different styles. Absolutely. However, I do think Sherry for me is better in an ensemble situation. Yeah, I, I, her on the View. It was like that cast when it was her. Lizzie, it was magic. Whoopi, it it was great. Yeah, it was magic. And Sherry, it's like she held her own. She stood on. Yeah, she made a fool out of. She drove me time. crazy, but she pushed me to deal with. You know who Sherry is? She's the uh, unwoke but really good human of a home she was girl. The heart. Yeah, like, like she was the heart. Like your cousin who does not know all the pretty activist words, but you you fuck with her heavy. Yeah. But she would factually be inaccurate, like God knows a million times. Yeah. But you always trusted her heart. She is a per Sherry Shepard is a person that I want to meet in person. Oh yeah, I can I see y'all being have friends. A conversation like I, so I'm putting that out there, I'm manifesting it. Yes, like, manifesting. I love me some Sherry Shepard. I really. So do. I just want to I want to reiterate because I'm not going to back down from what I said. I am holding two space for two truths to be true. Mm -hmm. I adore Sherry Shepard and I'm rooting for her, and I still miss Wendy. Oh, is it and just the time slot? Because no, it's not just the time slot. They gave her the set. The production team. What were they supposed to do with no, it? No, no, no. I'm not saying anything, but I'm <laughs> they, saying they ain't gonna let their money go to waste. I've been a Wendy Williams fan since 2003 when I first moved to the South Bronx to live on my own. Mm -hmm. So I've been a Wendy fan for 20 years. The thing, the space that Wendy carved, she was so good at it mm -hmm. that nobody can replace that. So I can clap that Sherry is a stabilizing force and is doing a great job. While also saying that thing that only Wendy can do, I miss it. Wendy yeah, was, like was like the was like the was like the sloppy fun auntie. She was we would kick in, with. even in her, in her last two seasons. Wendy wasn't giving us the Wendy we fell in love with. That's true. Honestly, them last two seasons, I, I as a fan was sitting there like, it's, okay, it's time for Wendy. To we kept waiting for her to yes, bounce back, yeah. and she didn't. And you she know didn't. who was surprisingly good during the chemistry test, but they probably turned it down. Stop watching. Um, I watched all the chemistry tests because I really would think Jason was robbed when they wouldn't let him because they almost had Jason on the show. Him as the he, I've always thought that Jason Lee was Wendy Wendy oh, Williams. That's who you were talking about 
Yeah. Oh. Jason Lee to me is the Wendy Williams heir apparent. Like I've always said this before I even met him. And Wendy thought so too, because they hang out all the time and she saw that Jason had the same kind of chutz- chutzpah that she has, right? When they said he was gonna come on with, with Cardi. Mm-hmm. So Jason Lee was gonna bring you Cardi B. So like, there was no reason not to do it. And I think he was too spicy. And I think they they still had heartburn from Wendy. And so I feel like Sherry is like calming yogurt after eating a spicy Indian meal. Well, yes, again, it's, again, it's very different. It's kind of like all the other, one thing I used to like about Wendy, she would always say, I'm not friends with these people because I got to talk about them. Yep. Sherry, you know, she's friends, with, these friends with a lot of them. Yeah. Just like the, uh, Kelly and Ryan and all these other folks, they're friends with these people. So that's why when they come on, they don't it they give them safe. Fuck. like my one of my and I could not stand him for this. Did you see when Trevor Noah interviewed Will Smith after you know the whole Oscar thing? Yeah. Will Smith was the first, I mean sorry, Trevor was the first interview that he did. And it was just like Trevor just babied him. Like yeah. it was clearly Will's one to come out, have the first word, apologize, everything. But it was like, Trevor, you just you're admire you're in admiration <sighs> of him. I get it's a big interview for you because the Oscars. I have a provocative take on Trevor Noah that I, is probably an unpo- unpopular yeah, opinion. Trevor Noah. Everybody does. I think Trevor Noah is a lovely man who says the right thing to please the audience. So I, he's charming, but I don't trust the rigor of him speaking his truth. I think he got dragged so much for not reading the room when he first got to America that now he constantly just says whatever black Twitter wants to hear. Oh, see, and I don't, o- yeah. And I don't always believe it. Like I remember having to write about some of his problematic jokes when he was edgier and he got dragged so much. Now he's gone to the other extreme where he's constantly pandering. Now why were it they doesn't, problematic feel- because they were hitting a certain group? Like why were they problematic? It was just like, you know, saying things that you would say in the kitchen table that you wouldn't say in person. And I think whatever the critique was, he was like, oh, I don't want the, once the Americans drag, you're dead for real, right? Mm. And so he went to the other side. So like, I, I understand why everybody else finds him charming, but to me, it feels very contrived and people pleasing. Even that thing when he was like, black women, you're the backbone of the whatever. Honey, we've seen who you date. Like, I think he, I just, I, I'm just, I'm, I just, it was a little heavy handed for me. So, yeah. I, so for me, he's a, again, he's a good person, but he lays it on a little bit thick in a way that I find hard to believe sometimes if it comes off a little disingenuous yeah. and people pleasing. Yeah. And my job is to call out people pleasers. I find him to be a great storyteller, but a bad interviewer. Because, ding, ding, ding. That's exactly that's it. And that's the funny you say that because whenever I, I watched the Daily Show when he was on there. He's amazing, but he's not authentic. Like when the people come, you know, they come out, he shakes hands, they sit down. It is like three minutes of Trevor sitting there because, you know, you're incredible. You know, you're amazing. You know, you're kissing this. ass, he's kissing ass kissing so much. And I'm like, Trevor, can we please get to it? And you know what? This is me calling bullshit, too, on myself. I'm doing a show where I only invite my friends. Mm-hmm. We sit around getting drunk. By the way, my oh, my, my martini. I need a refill. Oh, Thank I'm you. Going slow. Oh, you going slow? My my cup is empty. For anybody who can see, uh, I am sick. I have no makeup on. I've only left the house for an hour to do the show. Oh, That's how dedicated I am. Yes. And my friend, if my friend wants to bring me some uh, espresso martinis, I'm gonna drink them. Oh, and even the producer got oh, yeah, some we got too. The producers hooked up too. We'll make sure you get some after producer we finish Jeffrey. taping. <laughs> the, the, the producer's also named Jeffrey. There's a lot of Jeffrey energy happening. Too. And mind you, Jeffrey's also texting me. My other friend Jeffrey, our friend Jeffrey's texting oh, yeah. me right now. It's a little bit overwhelming with all the Jeffreys. This is all to say that I love Trevor Noah, but I love authenticity. Mm-hmm. And to me, he gave up some of his authenticity in a way that I can't help but uh, to see. I can't unsee him being people pleasing. So it's like, oh, okay. Sounds nice. Like you're saying, because it sounds nice. Uh, speaking of things that sounds nice, uh, predictions that we made on Grammy night. When Bonnie Raitt came on the stage, <laughs> I said to all of y'all, do y'all know who that is? And because half the room was full of millennials, like baby millennials and Gen Zers, they were like, who the heck? Is that? Is that Cheryl Crow? I was like, no, it's Bonnie Raitt. If y'all don't know who Bonnie Raitt is, please look up the song, I Can't Make You Love Me If You Don't. It is the most devastating breakup song in history. Whenever I would hear that song as a child, I would start the crying. The funny thing is, I, I know her visually. That hair... I the rec- skunk I know, trail. Yeah, I know she is a celebrity in country music. She's a legend. Would have never guessed her name. So That's I the thing. did not know her name, but I visually I know this. That's woman. where yeah. our, our five year age difference comes in because I was just born long enough to watch my mother's group kill her music in soft rock. Mm. So if you were listening to soft rock in the eighties and nineties, it was impossible not to hear Bonnie Raitt. And like VH1's like thing, right? Yes, she was a VH1 darling, (laughs) right? Her, Shania Twain, George Michael. Pop up video. Pop up video. (laughs) So Jeffrey's a little bit younger than me, but he's the the young uh, brother who would always hang out with the older kids. So he pretends to be my age all the time and they'd be freaking me out. Like, why do you know that B cut from Brownstone's second album? Like, what's wrong with you? My B cut playlist goes off. It really does. He's an old soul. So when I saw 
Bonnie Raitt. I was like, they don't understand in this room who the fuck Bonnie Raitt is. And she is in a category. And what did I say, Jeffrey? I said, watch Bonnie Raitt beat Beyonce and confuse everybody. No, 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 no. We no, we said that as a joke. I said it that was as, a joke. as a joke. Because y'all didn't even know who she jumped, was. No, I knew who she was. I, again, I recognize I jumped on it with you. They were like, no, nah, no. Nah. I was and like, I was like, Bonnie Raitt I was like, blue, that would be so funny. Blondie just cleared this whole category. 30, sec- 30 I seconds you, later. 30 seconds later. Who presented the award? Somebody who was probably equally confused. Everybody was confused. Bonnie was confused. She was like. Bonnie was like, y'all spelled Beyonce wrong. <laughs> it was so funny. Because we literally had joked. We were like, oh, it'd be funny if she cleared Bonnie that Bonnie Ray beat Beyonce. And let me tell you. I need y'all Blue. to understand how much they played Blue. this lady's face last no, night, y'all. <laughs> I streamed the song this morning. Listen, I've listened to it three times today. Oh. Song of the year? No, was she song of the year? Whatever, whatever she would. No, not, and now this is not even. And look, I didn't it's, say it's not break my soul. But it's no, not no. plastic off but the here's sofa. The thing, not even to give it to Beyonce. Other people in that category, songs were better than that. The the literally Jesus Christ and uh, Yahweh and Buddha were all in the category, and Bonnie Waite cleared the room. She was so confused. She that was, was like, one she was like, I, 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 would, I would say this though. In the midst of Beyonce just being played with left and right while being given tokens to keep her distracted, one thing that I am very clear is how much, for the first time, I've never said this before, I think me and Lizzo have more in common than I realize. Because when I first saw Lizzo on the scene, people always assume if you're a big girl, that any big girl who becomes famous, oh my God, that's who you remind me of. Shut up. I do not look like Queen Latifah. I do not look like Lizzo. I do not look like Nicole Byer. Any baby, I'm sorry. Queen Latifah looks so good on that stage. She last fucking night. did though. Dana by did. the way, can we say about Dana? Queen Latifah is the reason why I feel cute. Because back in the day when Khadija came out, all the boys were like, "Oh, oh Khadija kind of fine," and I started getting a lot of extra play. Because of Khadija James Khadija on Living James. Single. So I want to shout out uh, Queen Latifah for, for being the reason why I hit puberty early. Um, <laughs> because when people realized she was fine, I got to be fine too. So I didn't mind being compared to her, but people always think that you're like every big girl. Yeah. I always rooted for Lizzo, but never related to her because her pain is a lot more unhealed than mine. So the things she was crying about are things that I would never cry about after direct deposit. Mm-hmm. So I was like, oh, she's a little but bit. she's, what, 23, yeah, 4 she, or 5? Yeah, she's there. much younger, so I get it, right? So I've never related to her, even though you would think I would. Last night when I realized that Lizzo literally showed up with her man to get drunk with Adele and Kiki and fangirl over Beyonce and just hang out with her ratchet friends and have a good time I said Lizzo bitch we might be the same person to add to that though for me when she won her Grammy and exactly. she explained her thing is to make positive music that was where I was like Okay, I'll be a fan now. I'm and, a and, really but that was I a like gr- Lizzo, that was a I'm great like, clap back. I'm happy you brought that up because people who don't watch Lizzo's uh, who don't cover her, we have to cover her for work and stuff. But Lizzo has been told and chastised for only having white soccer moms who want to have a black you know savior as as their audience. And she said, if, she's happy. Exactly. She's but when you listen happy. to her music, it's all about being an underdog. It's all music for people of color, and so positive. she can't help who her audience is. So I love that after everybody said Lizzo, you're not for black people because your music is too positive she said well the godfather of everything y'all love prince is the person who inspired me to make uh, this happy music so f y'all mm-hmm. then she thanked beyonce for merely existing mm-hmm. said look i left school mind you i've heard that story before but i loved her telling beyonce to her face right. i i left school early and played hooky just to watch you and now i'm looking across from you in the same category crazy. that is that is god in the room there were so many and then adele because you know adele is, is a hood girl from london for y'all who don't know, Adele is a hood rat. She would do ratchet thing with her classy friends. So to see like Lizzo having a double date with Adele and their two beautiful boyfriends, and it was so beautiful mm-hmm. that I think that that's why so many of us in the room and on Twitter got angry because you knew Beyonce showed up because you told her you gassed her about th- these awards. Oh, yeah. You have her husband playing the finale. We we all know what we think is about to happen right before him when, when they announce album of the year. But y'all, they y'all can't be mad because she broke a record. We gave her that's that. A t- that's a booby Beyonce, prize. Listen, Beyonce had how many records? She was the first black woman in the dance Child. category. She was gonna be the most decorated Grammy winner, and she's gonna finally, after one, two, three, four chances, get album of the year. That's not y'all why she made Beyonce the album. To break every record in one night we wanted her to win the award that she actually deserved and that's my problem with these award ceremonies i watched them because i believe that you can be part of the mainstream and create your own thing i don't feel like you have to choose so folks were like why are you watching them we can build our own i can do both i want to do both for for you let's just say this is your job you were on the uh the grammy committee to vote and everything i would have caused a revolt no because one thing all of us don't know what exactly is the criteria? We can sit here and say, listen, and I'm with you, Blue. I think Renaissance, amazing body of work. What are the criteria is she won? But no, 
we don't know exactly what that paperwork says. There's say. no criteria where Renaissance was going to give me. And mind you, I'm just saying. I love Harry Styles. So this is where it gets interesting. Oh, I'm not. So that, oh, I, go ahead. So only two of us in the room had even heard Al, Harry Styles' album, and I was one of them. I listened to As It Was, the original and the remix by Prep, P R E P, guys. If you want a, a soulful version of Harry Styles, the As It Was remix by Prep is amazing. I listen to that song literally every day. Love that song. Still think that she was robbed. So it's not like I don't understand the caliber who else was there. I'm a fan of most of the contenders. Mm -hmm. And objectively speaking, I think the lady was robbed. For me, if not Beyonce, I think Kendrick should have won. Because Mr. Morale, exactly. I, from A to the end, it I was played not it. Harry that Styles. album goes off. But again, and just to be fair, yes, as a fan, even though I had other favorites in the category, I wanted Beyonce to win because I think Renaissance is amazing. However, I always when people are doing their job, again, we don't know what had to be checked. Literally, what if she missed it by one little nah, something that she child. ain't do? If you can't give Beyonce a, a move a decimal point from Beyonce, then Blue, you full you gotta, of shit. You got to remove emotion. Remove I removed the emotion. This is some bullshit. <laughs> remove this is some emotion. bullshit. I said I'm what I said. I'm just being fairer than people. Y'all played in that lady's face. I'm and I'm going to show you this this graphic. I Yes, you guys, I created a graphic. I'm going to send it to the producer to, show, to pop up on the yeah, screen right now. Now, that's not it. It's a graphic of every time Beyonce's had to smile in the camera in order to hide the fact that y'all played in her face. It's Beyonce losing to Taylor Swift, Beyonce losing to, to Moby, Beyonce losing to Adele, mm -hmm. and Beyonce losing to Harry Styles. And all four times, even the people who won thought that they had her award in their hands to the point where Adele felt guilty and apologized on stage. Y'all keep playing in this lady's face. And at a certain point, you have to ask yourself what? Susan Lucci took it 19 times. I understand. But Susan Lucci was not doing world tours being Erica Jane. Kane. Erica Kane. There we go. Erica Jane is the one who should be going to jail. <laughs> and actually, me making that faux pas is the perfect segue into Bravo Yay! Liberties. You guys, we're doing Jane, a new segment Jane, called Jane, Bravo Liberties. And this category will probably only occur when Jeffrey's around because Jeffrey is our resident Bravo expert. The I'm reason why we... Is. Well, I can't say Bravo because I don't do the the summer house and winter house and the. You don't. I'm strictly two shows. Okay, Housewives. I'm sorry, three shows. Uh, the Housewives franchise, uh -huh. Married to Medicine, which actually I think is the best franchise on uh -huh. Bravo, and Family Karma. So I'm gonna call Jeffrey the <sighs> the, the Bravo Housewives expert. Um, because we're manifesting that at some point you're going to be at BravoCon or hosting something. Jeffrey knows all the things about Bravo. And the reason why I wanted you to come to this episode is because last night was the season finale of Real Housewives of Potomac. For those of you who don't know, Potomac is what they called a part of Maryland because Real Housewives of D.C. <laughs> could not happen because the, the law and having politicians' wives, they cannot... Legally, it's all funny games to the FBI. To yeah, go. the FBI would be involved. So the reason why there's not a real hospital of DC is because of the law and the government, right? So they moved over to Maryland and Potomac, where all these women who don't live in Potomac got rental houses and pretend to live in Potomac so they could be part of the franchise. This year, the most polarizing storyline has been the un intentional but still prevalent colorism that's popped up oh. and, me, and me and jeffrey have had many conversations about this because he and i agree that there was never a moment where it, even though i don't like robin dixon and the way that she moves neither one of us think that robin dixon or giselle or even ashley ever sat around and saying it's us versus them as far as color lines mm -hmm. however it has been proven objectively at this point even andy has admitted it that whenever there's a double standard it for some reason always splits down color so when there's one rule, the light girls get the benefit of the doubt and the brown girls never get the benefit of the doubt. It's happened for so many seasons. At this point, we're not even asking if they're colorists anymore because that'd be intellectually dishonest. We're asking about what role it plays in the show and if we think it's time for them to get rid of the green-eyed bandits, a.k.a. Giselle and Robin. Not Giselle Bryant. Now, I don't think they're ever going to get rid of Giselle Bryant because Andy loves her and she's like a cold sore that he never wants to get rid of. Giselle's keeping the lights on at that yes. Potomac house. Giselle is just being messy for the sake the of West messy. Wing. <laughs> right. But Robin, though, I think there's an excellent case to get rid of Robin Dixon. Number one, she's a she's a brolic ass goon. OK, oh, let me tell you something. There's a stereotype of the big, fat, precious looking uh, chocolate girl who is a hater and likes to beat up pretty girls. Right. The funny thing is, Robin looks like the pretty girl who would get beat up that like that scenario but she's the one who actually acts like precious y'all keep calling big chocolate girls precious robin is actually precious oh, she's a big old brolic strong back bully who walks around chit-checking people while she has a roommate pretending to be a husband 
Let's not forget Juan Dixon got caught on the first season saying when he had a hot mic that I don't even want to be here. I'm just doing this for the show. We need to switch from martinis to shots. Okay. This is pew, 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 pew. Blue chose violence okay. to switch the next conversation. So Robin, big back. <laughs> Dixon. Let me say, if I ever see Robin in the street, I'm saying all this to her face and you know I am, Jeffrey. I'm about that life. So. Robin Dixon has been such a bully in high school. I used to bully bullies. So Robin, if you have a problem, come check on me. But Jeffrey, you're supposed to be the nicer one. How do you feel about the clusterfuck of a mess that Robin Dixon has gotten herself in? And just to give the audience context, Robin Dixon is the one always talking about somebody else's marriage, <laughs> but hers is only a business agreement. Hit it, Jeffrey. How do you feel about Robin Dixon? And what do you want to tell this audience about your problematic fave who needs to kick, kick bricks? Well, Robin is not my fave. Okay, good. Just O'Brien. But Oh, you going halfway to hell. <laughs> you only going halfway to hell. Zell Bryant. Um, but okay, from a mm -hmm. I am Andy Cohen standpoint, mm -hmm. producer standpoint. Andy can't stand Robin anymore either. Robin Dixon would not be invited back mm -hmm. next season to Potomac. Because this is my thing. You are on a reality show. You're here to give your real life. And the fact that you admitted you knew this prior to filming. And by this he means she knew that her husband had cheated on her and spent the entire season she, talking about other people's husbands while knowing that hers was the actual cheater. She saved herself by letting him come to that wedding. That's because if she had not let them shoot the wedding and she had held this you back. You mean and the last 30 Patreon, seconds of the finale? But still, she, okay. listen, had she not done that, she would have, out of doubt would have been gone. Right now, I haven't seen the reunion, so we don't know. But Robin. You're coming back after the reunions. We need to talk. Know. Yeah. For me, Robin would be gone just because, again, you openly admitted that you knew about this prior to filming. And also then have said that other cast members have known about it. Giselle. She said she don't think Ashley knew about it, but. It's been a legend. Actually, such a snake. Knew. But the thing is, it's like, Robin, you could have sat down with your homegirl Giselle and been like, listen, remember last year I wouldn't get out of bed during the pandemic? This is what's going on. This is what we're dealing with. And while majority of the season, everybody hates Robin. You go on Twitter, they are killing Robin. I think if she would have really had that moment, it would have gained her some a little more sympathy because that's real people are relating to that story. And I think what's interesting is Robin the entire season was so upset every time she felt like someone wasn't telling her all their business. Well, it she, hasn't been an amazing season. I understand, but Robin was a bully when it came to trying to get people to talk about things and not giving them room to say no. If Robin said she wanted to talk about a topic and you didn't want to talk about it, she would swell up on you like the Incredible Hulk mm -hmm. and verbally beat you down and square up on you to the point where people would have to step in and stop her from getting violent because she demanded to know your business. And the whole time you knew that your husband, number one, had a mistress from Canada who was coming up to see him you also knew These that your husband husbands. was you also knew that your husband was involved in a court case where he was the head coach and somebody was being catfished and sexually harassed and went to him as an authority figure for help and he turned a blind eye to them being abused and allegedly sexually assaulted. So you know that your husband is dirt is, is riding dirty on you. Left to right here and center. But you're spending the whole season being part of a of, of like a witch hunt on other people's husbands? Again. Exactly. I don't think Robin, Robin Dixon is trash. Robin Dixon, the way that she moved this season is trash. I don't give a fuck who from Potomac knows me because you know I lived in DC for 12 years. I usually keep it separate, but this year it got so mean spirited. The way they tried to destroy Candace's marriage. How do we feel about, again, a brown skin woman in a healthy marriage who can actually sing and has a talent outside of being on a reality show? You're picking her to, to, to pick on, even though you know she has the biggest mouth and will, will eat, you, eat you for dinner. They wanted Candace to have a moment of losing her cool, to bait her well, see, into Robin, destroying no, her marriage. Robin didn't come after her marriage. At first. Robin, she came after the, um, the comments Candace was saying on Instagram. Because mm -hmm. when Giselle brought up the issue she was having with Chris, Robin was like, I don't think. She even went and said and told. Like, Do you know what my theory so. is around that? I think Robin was being nice. I was like, why is Robin being so nice with this Candace thing? This is the kind of mess that she likes. I think this is the beginning, and she was still nervous that somebody was going to bring up Juan. So I was like, Robin was very defensive in helping well, yeah, Candace because she was oh, scared of her was own business. for somebody to bring it up. And again, that's so even why, you being nice is fake. Yeah, and for me, it's like Robin. It is, Robin, you've been from what we can tell, you have been so open. The first, the very first episode, season one, episode one of Potomac, was her going to her wedding dress, like getting ready to throw it out and everything. Like, yep. This relationship is a big part. So yes, I get it. Now he's proposed, so y'all are supposed to be in this happy place. But if it was an infidelity situation, Robin, you owe that to the fans because you've let us in. I get it. Y'all get to in your contracts be judicious about certain things. Robin, this is a very big thing that I that should have been a part of the story. Yeah. And again, 
it actually probably would have gained you more sympathy. Well, we want to play a clip from Carlos King. Uh, Jeff in production will play this for you guys when we come to this. And in this clip, we have Carlos King, who's producer extraordinaire. You guys know that he's often seen as like the black version of what Andy Cohen does. And he has all these shows that are in the pipeworks, especially on OWN. Carlos King is killing it over at OWN. And he released a video that was a clip from his podcast where he talks about why he was disgusted by Robin's uh, choice to not share her real life. Let's play that footage. I'm going to keep it all the way real on this podcast today because I I am pissed. Robin admitting that she hid her story from the world on the show that pays you is a slap in the face to everyone involved, including the audience. And the fact that you have the audacity to go on your podcast to reveal this, we spent this entire half-assed season with these made up storylines about Chris Bassett. And yes, I'm gonna say made up because I allegedly was told that a few of the housewives had a meeting before filming about what the storyline was going to be and that this Chris Bassett stuff was, was, was part of that conversation. I've always said there was something off about this season and now I know what it is. None of y'all are living your real lives. Your admission, Robin, has proven the fact that Potomac is nothing but a show about women exposing each other and, and throwing each other under the bus. It's not about real friendships, real relationships, or your real life. It's not about that anymore. I feel like the only persons who really want to give their real lives and, and really are looking for a connection with the cast is Candace, Wendy, Child, even Mia. <laughs> okay, so what do you think about what Carlos said about how he's just tired that she knew the entire time and had a contractual obligation to share her life and she basically admitted behind a paywall yeah. that she had been withholding things that she was contractually obligated to share? Yes, again, while I know that in these reality shows, again, they get to be judicious in what they share, mm -hmm. you're on a show about your life. Yep. And Robin, yeah, you've been talking about the wedding. Yeah, it's been jokes. Even before this this happened, it's always been jokes about, oh, Juan and Robin, roommates, and why are they still together living, blah, blah, blah. Robin, I do think this was a part of your story that you owed to your fans. Yep. And, and I can I can understand why she wouldn't do it because guess what? He just proposed to me and it was all this, this is. She's going to be embarrassed. Because let's just face it, the internet is a horrible place. So she was probably a dinner table with Robin Dixon is Melissa, a horrible place. Blue, also, she has kids. She has two kids. She didn't give a fuck about Wendy and her kids. Like she didn't care about Ashley and and, and that was Giselle that brought that up. True, but I'm I'm just <laughs> saying that nobody cares about the kids when it's other people's families. That, like you're sitting around basically trying to act like Chris is cheating on or trying to cheat on his wife. That's what Giselle was doing. That's Giselle. That's Giselle. Then Robin is instigating Wendy when Mia is clearly being a donkey. To the point where even me as a homegirl was like, you're being a donkey. And then she admitted, yeah, I'm being intentionally in the wrong here because I don't like you. Mm -hmm. When you intentionally pick on somebody when you know that they didn't do anything wrong because you don't like them, that's bullying. So I just feel like Robin is just too old to be playing these high school like playground games. She cheapens it. So my, my question is, where's that line where it stops being fun reality antics and starts just being disgusting? Well, for me, this, this season has kind of been like that because it just feels like it's gross. every episode. So I remember uh, prior to the premiere coming, I forgot who was being interviewed, but um, they were talking about, oh yeah, every episode is just like, bam, who's the, who's the target, who's the target? That's what it feels like. Game I don't of Thrones. feel like I'm getting, yes, Game of Thrones versus reality and it's yeah. just like every episode it's just about who can we throw an accusation at what's the shadiest line that was said it's like no like i'm watching a reality show because i want to see what y'all are doing that's so different and by the way what you know potomac is like mind you all of them bank accounts better than mine the brokest of all housewives franchises i'm not surprised they so damn broke compared to Pick a city. Giselle <laughs> looks like she's sponsored by Claire's Fashions. The, oh, the kiosk God. in the mall where eight-year-olds buy their first earrings from. Like, it, it's giving cheap. But you know what's funny, though? I think that It's giving now, plastique off the sofa, I not plastic off the sofa. eight years in, Giselle is kind of leaning into it. No, I think she's colorblind. I think the lady still thinks she's stunning on I us. I think some parts she's, like, leaning into it, because y'all go keep talking about her. No, but I think her taste level really is just that trash. Her I think, taste, her taste I think level, she's tried, and it's still just bad. Her taste level is first lady, just got out. 
It's trash. Like, you know, you got to be yeah. cut, cut, covered up all her life, you know, while being the first lady. You're finding and all these like, pretty Ooh. words for trash in the words of Candace. Not Giselle. today, Satan. Giselle. Not today, what? Nick. <laughs> The way that they go Candace after her is neck. A millennial. <laughs> <laughs> Candace is us. When Candace said not today, neck, I had to have a, a moment with myself. Like this lady's about to have me cackle over somebody having lines in their neck, and I know she can't help that. It's so funny how Candace watching is filthy. Candace, I'm sorry, keeping this mic. Watching Candace uh, now in scenes and in her confessionals because recently so a friend of mine was trying to catch up and so i watched a couple of the episodes with him mm-hmm. old episodes when candace first came on she was so pageant like you know how um black people code switch yes candace in front of that camera she was code switching that first season it was like who is this girl oh she and was trying that, to be nice she was trying, you can tell she just all housewives first season fish out of water that's uh-huh. why I think every housewife de- deserves a second season. Uh-uh. That's Sonya, girl. Sonya was From doing too where? much her first season. From uh, Atlanta. Sonya, Sonya, Sonya. The Olympian. Oh, first season. She, she made no sense. Season. She made no I, sense no, the first I'm season. I'm glad she's coming back. She's she was talking gibberish the entire fish time. out of water. So fish can't speak straight? Because you walk into this and you, you, you have an idea of what you're going into. Yeah. Because most of them, when you hear, they be like, yo, I thought this was fake. I thought it was fake. So they come in like, ooh, who I'm going to argue with or what I'm going to do. And then, now you, and then now, they get there and they realize, jail. <laughs> they realize, like, wait, what's going on? So then the second season, it's like, oh, I can actually. Drew wears me out, though. I do think Drew should be gone. This is about to be her third season. Drew needs Drew. to go. I think Robin and Drew need to be put however, on a boat. However, I want to go home. You know what keeps Drew on our TVs? Her uh, husband. He's a hot mess. Babe, that is the Michael Darby of the <laughs> black franchise. <laughs> the he black. is. It's, uh, what's Drew his name Dixon's Drew Ralph. And, uh, Ralph. Ralph. Ralph is always. No, not Drew Dixon. I'm not, not, I just mixed up Drew and Robin. Drew Dixon would be a great character. Ralph, it's like you know it's going to, every year it's going to be some shit. The first year he went to Tampa. Right. The second year it's the assistant. <laughs> Baby, I can't wait because I don't care about Drew. It's Ralph. What you going to give up this year, bro? keeps finding fascinating ways to openly to embarrass cheat. her. To openly <laughs> cheat on her. And then when they said well how do you feel about people saying he gaslights you she was like i don't feel like he gaslight me and they're like drew what does that mean now she does remember they she had to look up the word gaslight how you say he's not interview and then she read it in the interview and it was exactly what she was like oh oh oh, that does sound like him that's what that means he is what's keeping the lights on at the Pittman household ralph is keeping can we once and for all put this to bed that sharice is not the grand dame Oh, so I was thinking about this. Okay, yes. Mm-hmm. So again, you know, I'm original. Watch from the beginning. Now, here's the thing. I think she always are... looks bloated. So, Blue, can you? Can... Blue. She looks like she does. A... She always looks like she does a colonic. Like she's just waiting for some poo to come out. That's somebody's That's... mama. Uh, somebody's constipated mama. Sharice talks big shit, so I don't have to worry so, about being nice here's to her. The thing. I think there are two realities. I think we have the Bravo verse where we have the Housewives of Potomac, and yes. Karen Huger is, is the that undeniable bitch. grand dame. She's that However, bitch. However, I think in real life, Potomac. Sharice thinks she's a big deal. Not thinks. I think Sharice, because Sharice is actually the one in the beginning casting, you know, helping So was with Hazel the E. But, so was Mariah. But I, and also, you know, Sharice Jackson Jordan, her her wealth and her, well, her husband's wealth, with her whatever, her stature. I think in real life, no cameras. More people probably knew Sharice, more boards, more everything. Yes. But yes, in TV world, oh, Karen Huger, absolutely. But you so have, I think there are two different ways of... I think that it's the same reality. I think Sharice conflated being well-connected with being powerful and compelling. She, All of them do. Yeah, I think she thought because she was well-connected that she was more charming than she really is, that she was more compelling and dynamic than she really was. So Karen might be a nobody in her... Karen's so, 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 more charming. She's yeah, a Karen is more... Char- Oh, she is a tourist. She's a tourist yes. That makes so much fucking sense. Absolutely, because we still act like that now. Exactly. So I think and that a, a lot of you out there, right? Like you, you hang out with somebody who's considered a celebrity, but you go to a party with them, and you're the fun friend, right? Yes. Like just because somebody's connected doesn't mean that they're they're good on TV. And I think even her saying, somebody saw Karen sitting at my table and mistook her for one of my friends. That's the only way she got in. So her mind is this interloper who I didn't even want to be on the show has now taken my spot. But my thing is. Exactly, though. Because she wasn't your friend, she's not betraying you from taking your spot. She doesn't know you either. A complete stranger taking your spot is not a betrayal. I I could also see, again, because going back, you watch some old episodes. Season one, definitely. Karen and Sharice had, they had a friendship. Season two started falling apart. Um, I can see because Karen did become all of a sudden wildly popular. She Grand became Dame. she became who Sharice was. Sharice was already popular in those Potomac. That's circles, between her and her therapist. But Karen became popular, so I could see her. So we agree being she's being like, a hater. We agree huh? that she's being a hater. Who, Karen, I mean Sharice. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. But equally, I could see Karen letting fame go to her head. 
I don't care. I love Karen. <laughs> to me, Karen is like the I old like black God's lady. Stop lying. She's. Well, I mean, they all lie. I want Giselle to stop lying because then because what Giselle be lying about everything. Let me tell you. I think that what lightning Giselle strikes when about. Giselle lies about everything. Let me tell you, Giselle Bryant. Okay, Giselle Bryant is not my favorite housewife. However, she is slowly becoming a true contender. Because you, you, you like mess. No, I'm, 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 no you but, like mess. You you, you chose violence. Something. Giselle Bryant. She is keeping the lights on. She, I know, on be, because she, ha, but she has no story. She ain't got no man. So, she ain't got no, right no, okay. no family story. No. She ain't got no house that looks uh -uh. good. Her See, house is a no, hot no, mess. No, 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 no. You don't like her house, but that don't mean it's not a story. But the thing also with these, they always Giselle don't got a storyline. Giselle don't have a storyline. She doesn't. Here's the thing: we're seeing what producers have chose to show us because just like they did that flashback in the finale with her out on that date, why didn't they air it? That's her storyline. So no. So no, we're getting what they show back us. Back so to it's that not to link. say Giselle does not have real things in real no, life. No, no. Back, on. back to this is where I'm pushing back. Back to that audio of Carlos King. He said that he was told that there was a meeting. Oh, every, all of them do uh, it. Yes. I, like, I, not I, just no, from Potomac. I know, I'm talking I know, every franchise. But I'm saying that I don't think that Giselle's presenting things that aren't being shown. I think Giselle is very much probably the treasurer, or if not the chairman of that meeting. And she only chooses to do the manufactured shit, but doesn't actually have a real life storyline. It doesn't matter what happens in a meeting. Candace is going to have some story. Giselle, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter what happens in a meeting. And like I, Mia I and her back. weird ass is gonna have some story, but I think Giselle really has a dry life and just goes on whatever sabotage uh, commitment they come to in that meeting. I don't think she actually has a real I'm story. I'm push back though and say Giselle Bryant has three high school children. Yes, Giselle Bryant has a storyline. It's just what her are, kids but, be on. dragging her. But here's the thing: the producers, editors, they decide what is boring or not good before we see it. How do we? How do they know us seeing it? We would have thought them. it was. <laughs> I trust them. The same, you trust the hold on, you saying to trust the yes. same producers who let the Robin Dixon story fly over their head? No, somebody, no, the Robin's same a, way, a snake. No, 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 the same way that the cast get those texts and DMs and everything, they send it to the producers too. And some producer let that shit go I over their head. No, I think Robin's a bully who threatened to beat everybody up and take their lunch money if they told and her I blame secret. The producer then. So my thing is this I trust the producers to know what mess is the most fun to watch. See, that's the I thing. do trust them. I don't just watch for the mess. No, 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 no. But, but I'm saying that storyline is usually shorthand for mess. Mm -hmm. I think whatever, whatever Giselle has going on is probably geriatric and dusty. And that's why she always has to target other people. Now, we're going to do a quick pivot now because the show, unfortunately, we should have done this two hours. Because we could have had two more uh, martinis. And Let me tell you something. What? Y'all ain't going to come for my girl Giselle Bryant. Look, you better find I her. I find her fascinating. Well, yeah, she's very fascinating. You, you, I find her fashions fascinating as well. I'm gonna tell you why when we off camera. I'm scared to say it on. on uh, yeah. Camera. Well, Tamar <laughs> Braxton had some thoughts. I want to pull this up before we go. Tamar had some thoughts about what's going on, and she had some thoughts about Robin Dixon being a lying, and, a, a lying okay. ass trick. Uh, first of all, Nene Leakes was on the Breakfast Club and said that Robin's not a star. <laughs> she's a starless. Starless. But Nene, I'm S -T -A -R, sorry. I love her to death, but she's, Nene's a little bitter herself. Well, Nene, Nene is bitter with a capital B, but she, even the broken clock is right twice a day. Um, let me actually slow down because when I drink, I start speaking in Spanglish. <laughs> I just heard I was talking in cursive. Tamar Braxton recently wrote after watching the last episode, the finale of Real Housewives of Potomac, and said, my theory must be different because if a man pays for a hotel room for another woman, he definitely smashed her. And that was in reference to Robin went on Watch What Happens Live yesterday. And mm -hmm. when Andy said, well, what do you have to say about the woman who cheated with your husband? She said, she didn't cheat. She didn't sleep with him. And then Andy said, we literally saw a hotel receipt in his name with her. When she was in America, well, you know and what Robin his Dixon, boy, you know what his boy Michael Darby said. I fell asleep. She took a picture when I went to get my phone. Michael Darby also said he wanted to suck uh, on speed, I think, allegedly. So Michael Darby's quotes are not a good reference. But Robin's story was, well, Juan told me that she showed up to uh, Maryland without him really knowing because she, she claimed she was here to see a Baltimore Ravens player that she was dating. And he, he didn't know she was going to be in town. And then she called him crying from the hotel lobby saying, I'm in town and my credit card was stolen in the casino. And I need you to come put your, the room on, on your card. Yes. Robin said that she believed that story. Andy was like, that sounds like bullshit. The woman herself actually today, as of the day of this taping, came forward and said, I've never heard that story before. Juan and I were hanging out. Why would I come to him? And, it, and then she pointed out that, number one, she wasn't a gold digger asking for Zelle payments, like Robin said, because there's no Zelle in Canada. So that's factually Robin being caught in a lie. And number two, Juan Dixon told this woman that he and Robin are only pretending to be married for television. It's a business arrangement. They're just roommates, and he's allowed to date other people. Before we wrap up, what are your thoughts around the fact that it's not just Robin keeping 
infidelity a secret. Robin has been a truth crusader, allegedly, on the show. And the whole time, she actually had the best storylines that she's been lying to all of us. What is the, what is the role of the, re the reality star when you're lying to your audience well, while pretending to be a truth teller? I think that... I mean, number one, Juan absolutely smashes one. We all know that. We, like, we Juan all slept with that lady. We all know Juan slept um, with that and lady. I think, again, it's always two truths. One, if that's what he told Robin, that's the only story she has to go with. She has her gut and common so sense. Saying, that's a, now, and then there's number two, Robin, you ain't that damn dumb. I mean. You, you ain't. She ain't that stupid. But again, I... I don't live with Robin and Juan. I don't know what's going on. All I know is they Juan don't live with Robin and Juan. <laughs> <laughs> All I know is they are on a national platform and they have two children. I've been around and because I've been around some of these reality stars that actually have kids and I see what goes on when the doors are closed and no cameras are around. I don't excuse any again from a production standpoint. Yeah, Robin, you're not coming back next season. You should have gave us that. You signed this contract. We're gonna air you to you, whatever. Yeah, but. I, the excuses, the things she says about their father, because they might not watch the show, but when they get to school, one of these kids' parents or these kids, and it's just a lot that these kids I, have to deal with. I'm so going to say the most. It's hard. But uh, yeah, Juan absolutely slept It's with not hard for me. I'm going to say this. I'm a, I only show the grace that I'm given. Robin didn't give a crap about Wendy's kids when she invited everybody else's children but Wendy's children to an event just because Wendy called her out on her bullshit, right? Robin has done things that could be harmful to other people's kids on several occasions and not given a fork. So live by the sword and die by the sword. If you are not thinking about how your actions and your ugly deeds and your conniving ass plans to sabotage people's rep rep reputations and relationships, if you don't care about that, question, okay. let me finish, if you don't care about that when it's going outwards, if you can't be asking for that grace that you're not giving when it's coming inwards. So I think that Robin should stop being a hypocrite and live by the same sword that she's wielding in front of other people's faces. Even Andy Cohen, who's <laughs> so, a messy queen in his own, apparently. A, Blue, Even you know, Andy Cohen has called her a hypocrite. Blue, you know I'm not a Robin apologist at all. You sure? I'm sure. I, I'm on the side of sometimes what's fair, which might not always lean towards the, the villain at the time. Robin is nowhere near fair. Because you say, you know, she didn't care about Wendy's kids when she had the field day and everything. I don't take that as being about Wendy's kids because how would Wendy... Well, first of all, once we saw the field day, they didn't miss out on anything. But secondly... Them kids wouldn't have known what they did, what they missed out on, unless Wendy went home and was like, y'all, Miss Robin is doing this, this, and that. So then Wendy is making these it. Uh, it I still think, as, as, I'm, as a mother figure, because I have a lot of godchildren and I've raised a lot of the kids in my family because that's how Latin Americans roll. When you are on television to millions of people. She stuck up for Chris, though. Well, yes, and even a broken clock is right twice a day. We can't keep on dying on that. And that was only because she had her own shit to be worried about. You cannot, in front of millions of people, shun my children and think that they're not going to find out that somebody went around the room checking everybody's kids but them. That is naive at best. And once they saw, I'm sure they were like, Mommy, I'm No, eventually the next know. episode they saw it was trash. <laughs> like, oh. But I'm just saying, it's still something that could have been potentially hurtful, and we only know in hindsight that it wasn't. She does not think about other people's kids. She's admitted that she does what's petty and what works for her so i'm just gonna say this guys we are going to be at the point where we all know reality stars we all friends with reality stars at some point jeffrey i, I see that one of us is, if not both of us is gonna end up on somebody's reality show Oof. and i have to ask the final question is if you were on a reality show what would be the, the code of ethics that you would live by so that you could make good tv but not be a shitty human that people talk about on podcasts code of ethics Yes. Like, what, what would be your, your lines in the sand? You said code of ethics and reality TV in the same sentence? I sure did. I mean, for me, I've just, I don't know how to be anybody but me. Mm -hmm. So my be authentic. code of ethics is literally just be, that's the only one, be authentic. Okay. I have, other than that, no. And my code of ethics would be not to say anything on camera or off camera that I wouldn't say in front of a judge proudly. That's how I am about social media. If I wouldn't repeat that shit. That's in a, like what? Like being an argument like I'll kill you? Yeah. I don't say anything that I wouldn't repeat in court. Yeah, of course. If you, no, no, not of course, honey. Because half of reality TV is litigious as hell. People have prosecutors watching shows to like indict oh, folks. I mean, listen, if you're doing crime, don't go on reality yeah, TV. Yeah, so I'm if just you saying. you doing crime, But just in general, my code of ethics would be I would not do anything, even for a great show, that I could not proudly look at myself in the mirror and be okay with that night or proudly say to my kids and my family or say in a court of law. Now, what if and all of that every single one of those rules has been broken now, what if the on thing the is, shows. What if the thing you didn't go in, like, let's just say I came into this scene with the didn't have my ethics code and your reaction to me took you out of whatever these ethics are. I trust me enough to know that whatever happens, the real me is going to show up and not a pandering ass version of me that's trying to get a look.
Not no 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 not pandering, but just out of character. No no, I'm allowed cheat meals. If you do some shit that means that we're so gonna that's, no, that's what I mean. Yeah yeah yeah. I'm allowed to like, cheat meals. You, you didn't go in with If intent. I whoop your ass on TV, everybody will understand how I got there by the time I, I lay hands that's on you. That's what I'm saying. Like sometimes. Shit just happens. Yeah, but, can, but Robin talks about both sides of her neck. So, guys, thank you so much for watching this episode. This was our first reality roundup. And what's so interesting is, is that, like, I think we're talking about these shows. And on one hand, some of them are fake, but it's still real life. Reality TV has both words in it, reality and TV. Mm -hmm. We can't use a TV part as an excuse to let go of your basic, like, humanity, right? Now, Jeffrey, we're, you're definitely going to come back. Sure. So I know we're gonna have some spicy thoughts when we have the reunion. Yes. So that's gonna be probably in a couple of weeks. Uh, for those of the people who haven't heard from you this year yet, because this is your first time back with us for 2023, how can they find you on social media? Everything for me is at Jeffro Five, J E F One F R O Five. And you guys know I'm blue centric as usual. And like we always say, we're all just human beings having human shit. Uh, we just drank two of these amazing espresso uh, martinis. Jeffrey, you are a king amongst men. Thank you for bringing this. And until next time, love you guys. Bye.